Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 13th to the 19th of January. I'm Features Editor Ezzie Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzie. How are you? I'm doing well. So let us know, what do we have to look forward to in this week's night sky? Okay, well, you know, January is turning out to be a very busy month. So we have a full moon this week, and Mars is very much in the spotlight for reasons I will explain. We have deep sky target M47 well placed for deep sky observers who want to point their scopes at it. And we also have Venus and Saturn at conjunction. So moon wise, you'll be very pleased to hear we have a full moon visible from dusk till dawn until the 13th. And as you and I always talk about the names, as I'm sure you do with Mary and the name of each full moon for each month. So This year's first full moon is known as the Wolf Moon, a lovely name. It originates from Native Americans and Europeans. And as you can imagine, it's so called because the wolves are very active at this time of year. And when food is scarce, there is a lot of howling going on. Yes, we talked to the, in fact, the last time that you were with us, we were talking about the Beaver Moon, which is the November Moon. And I I made some short videos about that one, which meant I got to look at a lot of cute, fluffy rodents. So I'm very excited about the fact that I'm going to get to look at pictures of cute, fluffy wolves. (laughs) I did see the video. Yeah, I liked it. You did well there. (laughs) Probably to the people who were naming it, the wolves weren't seen as as cute. They were more dangerous predators that they needed to be (laughs) worried about that were around. You know, it it does also have some other lovely names. It's also called the Ice Moon, the Old Moon, or I like this one, the Moon After Yule. Yeah. Lovely name, which actually originates from Anglo-Saxon tradition and is the name given to the first full moon after the December solstice. So, yeah, I think I'll just be calling it the Moon After Yule from now on rather than the Wolf Moon. And on the afternoon of the 14th, the moon will also be at Pelion, so at its furthest point from the sun when the moon is on the opposite side of the Earth to the sun, hence why we have the full moon at that time. Now, the full moon and Mars are very close together on the night of the 13th, and as the night goes on, the gap between the two closes in, and we have a lovely conjunction between them in the early hours of the 14th. So... Mars will sit around 10 arc minutes of the northern limb of the moon. So from then, from the 13th and into the 14th until dawn, Mars and the moon, they're going to make a fantastic pairing in the sky. And actually, when I was looking this up visually online, it actually looked like the moon had its own little moon, <laughs> which I thought was quite <laughs> nice. A little orange moon. So it was like something like Star moon. Wars. Yeah. <laughs> so the two will be highest in the sky around 12.24 a.m. at 63 degrees above the southern horizon. Another great thing is you won't need an optical aid to see them together because both are going to be shining very brightly. But if you want to get your telescope or binoculars out, then both will easily be seen in the same field of view. But having said that, Ezzy, I'm just thinking, if it's the full moon, it might drown Mars out a little bit because mm. it'll be so close together. But we'll we'll see about that on on the morning that happens, I guess. And we also have the two brightest stars of Gemini, Castor and Pollux. They can be seen to the top right of the moon at the time as well. So, yeah, it's going to be fab. Look forward to seeing that. And in some parts of the world, the Americas and Africa observers will see a lunar occultation of Mars. Of course, we won't see that here in the UK just because of where we are latitude wise. So, Yes, we unfortunately, we don't get everything. Sometimes stuff's appearing at the wrong time of day when the moon's already below the horizon for us or it's the the sun's risen or something like that. Yeah, we don't have a solar eclipse for years and years. And yeah, the UK is quite hard done by. (laughs) So on the 16th, Mars is opposition, which means it's opposite the sun and the sky with Earth stuck in the middle. And it also made its closest approach to Earth and 12. So Mars is going to be large and it's going to be bright. And due to the shape of Mars's orbit, it actually spends a lot of time at distances further from Earth and closer to us. 
So the apparent size and brightness varies quite considerably when viewed from Earth. So at times when Mars does come closer to us, it's a perfect time to get in as much observing time of the red planet as possible. And obviously the listeners can't see what we're looking at here, Azzy, but you can see in this diagram that I have shared with you, you know, Mars does look significantly bigger. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. Every episode we have a transcription, which I put a link to in the show notes. I will drop that image into the the transcription so if people would like to see it because you can very clearly see that the apparent size of Mars on the night sky, it, it really does get a lot smaller and a bigger and smaller at different times of year. Yes. Yeah, it's quite noticeable, isn't it? So you can see why people spend a lot of, you know, the weeks leading up to this happening and afterwards observing it and photographing it a lot. So, yeah, it's fantastic. So Mars only reaches opposition once every two years. So this is another reason why people get excited about it. And, you know, this year Mars is well placed in the sky and with medium to large telescopes, you can make out the polar ice caps and even dust storms. And when I was doing a bit of research, I came across a fantastic guide on the Skylight website about observing Mars tonight. Yes, as uh, I will find that as well and put that in the show notes as well. So if you want to find out how you can really get to grips with seeing Mars, then do go and check that out. Because it is a wonderful planet and there's a lot going on and you can see a surprising amount about it. People always talk about, you know, seeing Jupiter or Saturn through a telescope for the first time because you see the moons or Saturn's rings or, you know, the great red spot. But you can actually make out quite a surprising amount of detail on Mars as well. Well, that's it. Yeah, and I think, you know, like we've just said, you can see ice caps and and dust storms. So it's very, very interesting that from here on Earth, Mars probably is, well, is the only planet that we can see features on. It's because the, the only one, one we might be able to see features on would be Venus. And we can't because it's covered in a ridiculously thick layer of atmosphere. So all we see on Venus are clouds. Yeah. <laughs> and Jupiter, as you mentioned, you know, we you can see the great red spot, but Mars certainly has a lot more to offer for sure. I think also because Mars is very Earth-like in some ways, whilst being completely alien. And sometimes people do think that Mars is just this dead rock without much going on. But it it does have weather, it does have clouds and dust storms, and it's got these two ice caps, which do change with the seasons. Um, it's actually a surprisingly dynamic world. So I think that's that's nice to be able to see for yourself. Geomorphologist dream. Mars, <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> To see Mars, this lovely planet, it's going to be visible in the east from around 5pm, reaching its highest position of 63 degrees in the south at midnight. It's going to be shining very brightly, minus 1.4, so it's going to be unmistakable in the night sky because it's going to be orange and shiny, basically, <laughs> in simple terms, so keep an eye out for that. Then on the 18th, we have dazzling Venus and Saturn making a close approach and conjunction today. Both will be visible from around 5.15 in the south, sitting at an altitude of around 20 degrees. So Venus is still super, super bright, as it always is, really. It's minus 4.4, while Saturn will be much dimmer, a magnitude of plus 1.1. And both are naked eye targets and will be visible until around 8.45 p.m. when they have set or when they will set. And yet we have Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune. They'll be visible all week as well so lots of planets to keep an eye out for and comet wise well you know obviously Shushan Shan Atlas it's not a well actually I don't really know it's um what's happening with Shushan Shan Atlas now is he I'm assuming it's kind of well disappearing now definitely well past its prime at this point I think at this point we'll just have to bit of podcast magic for you we do record these uh, slightly ahead of time and comets are so unpredictable that with Susan Shan Atlas at this point, it's going to be hard to tell exactly what it's going to be visible at. We do have a running record of what's going on on our website. I'll, again, put a link to that in the show notes below. So if people do want to find out up-to-date information about that comets going on, then we'll be on there. Thank you. Yeah, great. So on the 13th, I mean, I... I didn't know too much about this comet, but Comet C2024G3 Atlas is at perihelion, so it's really close to the sun. 
and we can't see the comet at the moment because it's so close to the sun, around four degrees. And I also think it's not visible in the northern hemisphere. But what I found interesting was that sources online did suggest that this could become a bright comet in 2025. But as we know, and as you've just kind of said, some comets fragment as they pass close to the sun or they completely evaporate. Yeah, and also I was really interested to read that this comet may be paying the inner solar system a visit for the first time, which means there is a much higher risk of it disintegrating. The ones that tend to be the most spectacular do tend to be ones where it's they're visiting the solar system for the first time or so almost the first time, just because they haven't been around the sun 27,000 times and, and lost most of their ice and, and dust. It's It's that sort of first flush of of getting up close and personal with the sun and, and all of that evaporating away. But it does mean that it's they're quite hard to predict when they're going to arrive because we don't know that they're coming until they arrive because <laughs> they've not been here before. That's the that. You know, I did think that was quite interesting to read about. And as I mentioned, it has been predicted it could become a bright comet this year, but who knows? <laughs> it could it could also just completely break up when it's going past the sun. I know, and that'd be a shame, wouldn't it? Because you know, as we've said, we had the excitement of Sush and Shan Atlas, but since Neo Eyes, really, there hasn't been too many naked eye comets. So, yeah, we'll, well, you know, we'll be talking about this, I'm sure, over the next few months. So keep an ear out to, to find out what happened to, to G3 Atlas. And on the 14th, just to close this episode, um, we have Open Star Cluster M47. It's a great target for deep sky observers over the next few weeks. And at midnight on the 14th, it's going to reach its highest point in the sky at an altitude of approximately 18 to 20 degrees. Again, this kind of will vary depending where you live. And it can be located in the constellation of Puppis, the Stern. So Puppis is actually a southern hemisphere constellation. But here in the north, we can see the northern portion of it from late winter into spring. Now, Sirius, a very bright star in Canis Major, it's a great target to use to locate Puppis which is immediately south-south-east of Canis Major. And M47 will be best viewed from just after 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. on the southern horizon as it makes its way towards the southwestern horizon. So at a magnitude of plus 4.4, it is classed as a naked eye target, but it can be quite tricky to spot even in dark sky areas. But yeah, you can view this star cluster through binoculars or a small telescope. So a nice little challenge for everyone towards the end of the week if, if they want to go out and look for something in the deep sky. Open star clusters, they can sometimes be, there's like globular clusters which are really filled with stars and you're looking at them and they look kind of like a, like a star explosion really. And open clusters are a bit, as the name suggests, they're a bit more open, they're a bit more spread out, but they are still wonderful things to, to take a look at with your, with your telescope. But thank you very much for taking us through all of that, Catherine. If you would like to hear even more stargazing highlights, please do subscribe to the Star Diary podcast and we will be back here next week with even more. But to summarise this week again, the 13th of January sees the full moon, the wolf moon. Mars and the moon are going to be positioned very closely together at that time, so that will be a great photo opportunity there. And Comet C2024 G3 Atlas is at perihelion, so we'll have to see how that one measures up, whether or not we can have another really nice comet or whether it will fall apart. On the 14th, we have a conjunction between the Moon and Mars, as well as a great opportunity to see open star cluster M47, which will be well positioned in the constellation of Puppis. On the 16th, Mars is going to be at opposition, where it will be opposite the Sun. And on the 18th, a dazzling Venus and Saturn will make a close approach as they will both be at conjunction. And throughout the week, Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune will all be visible. So lots of great things to see out there in the night sky. Hopefully you'll manage to get some really good observing in and we'll see you back here next week. From all of us here at Star Diary, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.